because I want to save lots of time for the discussion. So thank you so much for coming this morning um, to the DuPont Summit. Uh, this is my second time coming to the conference, and so I am actually really enjoy the conference. It's a science technology policy conference, and this session is on poverty in science and technology policy. And so, as you know, currently the, the issues of poverty and inequality are garnering lots of attention around the world. Um, global inequality is rising. There's racial unrest in the USA. Um, Europe has, faces waves of immigration, economic immigrants. And so can science policies create better institutions and encourage inclusive innovation? Um, this panel will discuss the nature of inclusive innovation and the type of S&T policies that are needed to make technology more inclusive. Um, each panel will give a short introduction of maybe their research or their organization. But really, most of this time is spent with questions and answers, especially from the audience. So we want to interact with each other, because there's lots of issues here. And all three of these panelists are so interesting. So I could spend an hour myself, like I said, talking to them individually, because they have such good insights. So we have three people today. First is Karthike, Karthike Singh. Um, Karthike is currently a fellow at the Center for Global Development, where he focuses on energy access innovation. Prior to joining CDG, or CG, CGD, he served as a South Asian energy officer at the U.S. Department of Energy, and working on U.S. India and U.S. Pakistan bilateral energy cooperation. He received his Master's of Environmental Science from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and his PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy from Tufts University. Um, we also have Michelle Jones. Michelle Jones is a Science and Research Program Manager with the Higher Education Solutions Network and Fellows Team in the Center for Development Research in the U.S. Global Development Lab at USAID. While at USAID, she served as the USAID Ebola Task Force during the 2014 West African Ebola outbreak and spent four months overseas in Indonesia helping to design new science innovation programs and worked with the President's Malaria Initiative Team in the Office of Health, Infectious Disease, and Nutrition. She received her MSPH in Microbiology and Emerging Infectious Disease from the from the George Washington University and holds a BA in Biological Sciences and Physical Anthropology from Mount Holyoke College. She has worked at the DC Department of Health, Sabin Vaccine Institute Global Network for Neglected Tropical Diseases, and the US Naval Medical Research Unit number three in Cairo. Prior to pursuing a master's, she taught high school, high school biology in Charlotte, North Carolina with Teach for America. So she has lots of great stories about teaching as well. So we can share those. Um, finally, we have Donaraj Tankor. Um, he is a research manager at the Alliance for Affordable Internet. He has been designing and leading research projects on ICT policy and regulation, gender and ICTs, and the socioeconomic impacts of ICTs in developing countries for the last 10 years. Um, this includes assignments with the World Bank, the IMF, I IDB, and several government NGOs. Um, of course, and he's published lots of um, publications in peer reg journals, so check out some of his publications. They're really good. Um, previously, John Raj held faculty positions at Tennessee State University in Nashville, US, in Nashville and the University of West Indies in Jamaica. Prior to that, he worked in community development with the government of Jamaica. He's a former Fulbright Scholar with a PhD in public policy from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Um, so each of these scholars are, are, are great folks. Uh, Don Raj actually was, when I was a student, he was a quote unquote senior grad student. And so if, I, if it wasn't for John Raj, I wouldn't be sitting here. He helped me, get, he helped me graduate, he helped me get through. Some, um, Michelle, she actually um, led me and my, some of my students around USAID and gave us a tour. So it was, I really appreciated her enthusiasm about uh, USAID and her knowledge. And Karthike, so um, when I was trying to figure out people for this panel, I emailed one of my friends, a senior scholar, and I said, who can we have on this panel? And he immediately said Karthike. And so I really do appreciate these folks for coming out. And I'll turn it over to Michelle Jones. Um, she'll start us off, and then we'll work through the panelists and then open up this for discussion. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to join you this morning. Thanks so much for coming, and thank you to Thomas for organizing this panel. I work in the US Global Development Lab at USAID, and I'm going to speak to you about how we can use science and technology to end extreme poverty. So first off, how many of you have gone to the grocery store in the last week? 
So think back to when you were shopping and try to think of how many things on the grocery shelf you could buy for $1.90. Not too much, right? <laughs> so I went on Peapod. Here are a couple things that cost $1.90 at the grocery store. Not too much. Um, you could presumably survive on some chickpeas, um, but this is not a lot of food that you can buy with $1.90. $1.90 is the international poverty line. So this line is how much people are earning in one day and have available to purchase food, to put their kids in school, to buy medicine, to pay any type of transportation fees. This is not a lot of money. And this is how the World Bank defines the international poverty line. There are millions of people around the world that are living on that much money per day. This is not a lot. What we define by this is anyone who's living below $1.90 per day is defined as living in extreme poverty. Um, but just this kind of economic measure of extreme poverty doesn't quite capture the whole story. Um, when we talk about extreme poverty, we're really talking about a whole suite of kind of conditions that people are living under. They're suffering from lack of health, lack of food, possibly shelter, not having access to clean water, not having the general economic opportunities that we would hope for people to have around the world. This is a huge problem that really kind of underpins all of our efforts in international development, is how do we raise these people out of extreme poverty? Today, it's estimated that 702 or 702 million people live in extreme poverty. This is actually a pretty remarkable number because over the last couple of decades, we've been able to cut that number in half. So we've made really considerable progress in helping to attack this challenge. Um, fortunately, we still have this many people living in extreme poverty, which is not an acceptable number. The international community's goal is to, to end extreme poverty by 2030. So we now have less than 15 years to uh, kind of channel our efforts into attacking this problem. Um, we really have seen considerable gains, but we still have quite a long way to go. So I represent the US Agency for International Development, and our goal right in our mission statement is to end extreme poverty, and we're aiming to do so um, to uh, kind of create more democratic, resilient societies. This goal sounds really good just from a kind of personal do-gooder type of spirit, but we actually believe that ending extreme poverty has a, a huge impact on the United States economic security and prosperity. Development is seen as kind of the 3D model of development, diplomacy, and defense. And so we really see this as an integral effort around the world to help to, yes, definitely do good for the millions of people that we're trying to impact, but we also see it as a benefit to all of our citizens here in the US as well. My specific team is called the US Global Development Lab. We are considering ourselves an innovation hub. We launched in 2014, and we are USAID's kind of leading effort around science, technology, innovation, and partnership. And we work around four uh, kind of key uh, areas where we're trying to apply these principles in order to make our efforts more impactful. One of them is that we aim to be open and inclusive. We truly believe that good ideas can come from anywhere, and so we're trying to open up the pool of people that can bring those ideas to us and find ways to engage new voices in the mix that have never before been engaged in this process. We also are evidence-based. It's very important for us to collect data and evidence and analyze it and actually use it to make decisions. Um, development, some projects have been going on for years without much change. We're really trying to shake things up and really look at the data to tell us how to move forward. We also hope to be catalytic, and that means that we are trying to use what is really pretty limited resources to have a much larger impact. So we're trying to bring in new investments, new partners, how to, we can leverage our relatively small amount of funds to really have a larger impact. And then finally, we are agile. So we try to have feedback loops built into our programming so that we can see what's happening, make decisions quickly, and adapt and change ongoing so that we're not kind of stuck in a long-term project that we know is not going anywhere. We can kind of see what's working, see what's not, and make those pivots in real time. So why science and technology in this effort to end extreme poverty? So if we look back in history of international development, some of our most notable successes come from science and technology or research and development. 
Um, if you look at things like polio vaccines or oral rehydration salts, these are things that grew out of science and research, have now been applied at scale, and have had really large impacts around the world. These are not by any means perfect solutions. Um, the Green Revolution is a very controversial um, if for effort, but it has really had impact in lives, in saving lives. And so we point to these as really good examples of how you can support science and research to actually lead to impact overseas. We also have seen um, through economic studies that if you look at the connection between research and development and GDP, that 50 to 70 percent of those increases can be attributed to research and development. This is really huge. There's a very clear connection between supporting R&D and seeing increase in GDP. And so this is something that we point to as good evidence of why this is a successful place to invest, because we know that it can have an impact in a country's economic prosperity. Because of all of this, USAID has supported um, a lot of research and development. In fiscal year 2015, we spent $425 million. That's spread across the agency, covers many sectors, global health, food security, conflict, um, water, sanitation. We're really trying to support research that can help us to design better in, uh, innovations, better programs overseas, and actually see the impact that we're hoping for. Many of you are probably familiar with this diagram. These are the sustainable development goals. These follow on the Millennium Development Goals. And if you look across these uh, 17 goals here, every single one of these needs science and technology in order to reach those targets. There are 169 or something indicators that are designed to help us track our progress against this. But in order to see impact, we need science and technology to help us deliver on these objectives. So this is basically how you can think of international development. <laughs> Nobody wants to untangle this, but we have to. Um, every single one of those wires is all a challenge, a problem that we're trying to make sense of. And if we only look at one of those colors, we're never going to solve the problems. This is a very complicated, very interrelated, um, multidimensional challenge. And what we need is science and technology to help us unravel this. So I see kind of four big challenge areas that I would like to implore all of you to think about today as how we need to kind of address these challenges before we can fully realize the benefits of science and technology for development and ending extreme poverty. Um, the first one is the science and technology demand. So just doing science, just creating a cool technology is not enough to get us where we need to go. Uh, it has to be demand driven which means there has to be a person, a community, a country, a specific problem that defines why we do this work. Doing science and technology research in a vacuum gets you nowhere. So sorry to crush any academics uh, dreams, but a publication does not Im equal impact. So publications are great. We know that it's essential in order for you to get tenure and promotion and to be established in the academic community, but unfortunately, People at USAID like me, I have not opened an academic journal in years because there's just simply no time to do so. As much as I would love to kind of stay up in the literature, it just doesn't happen. And so thinking that you're publishing and oh my gosh, this is gonna get into the hands of the people that need it to answer questions, that disconnect is not there. And so it has to be demand, there has to be some reason why you're doing this work in order for it to matter. Another one is open access and, and equal opportunity. So United States is phenomenal at supporting research, getting publications out. We do this in a well-oiled machine and it's fantastic. That same infrastructure does not exist everywhere in the, around the world. Um, we really need you to go local to help work with new voices in this, in this work, to involve local researchers, local governments in your efforts to perform science and technology research or R&D. Um, and it's not enough to design for the poor. You have to design with them. Otherwise, you're always gonna be coming up short in the targets that you hope to see. A cool example of what I mean by this is in Uganda. So the government of Uganda has been working to address landslides and flooding that has been caused by population growth and climate change. And the government launched a series of initiatives to help address this problem. But they found that the communities were not really 
paying attention to what they were saying. So there was no uptake or cooperation with the policies that the government was putting in place. One of our network members that we support, the Resilient Africa Network, which is based at Makerere University in Uganda, excuse me, Uganda, they use something called deliberative polling, which is a technique that was piloted by Jim Fishkin at Stanford, where you essentially um, do a baseline poll of a community, then you engage them in really interactive dialogue that helps to get at the, the nature of what you're kind of focusing on. So in this case, why, um, why are land sites a problem? Um, how have you responded to these policies? Do you even know about these policies? You, you kind of engage in this interactive dialogue. And then you do a follow-up poll that allows you to assess how those viewpoints and perspectives have changed over the course of those dialogues. And what we've seen is that um, this helps to bring in these voices into this policymaking process. It identifies areas that the government was not thinking about when they you know, put these policies into place. It helps you decide and kind of understand why are people returning to areas where landslides have happened when they know that there's a high likelihood it could happen again. It helps to kind of unlock some of that knowledge and it helps the government design better policies that actually get the impact that they're looking for. Oops, sorry, I skipped ahead quite a bit. <laughs> Sorry for the sneak peek. OK. <laughs> so the next thing is uptake and use. So this is related to demand in that once you get knowledge, whether you have a publication or you have a new technology, you can't stop there. You have to think about what comes next. The translation piece is really critical. And in order to do really impactful science and technology programming, you have to think about the action that's associated with that work. So you have to be thinking, as you're doing your research, even if you're you know, in the lower basement of a lab working there for hours, you have to be thinking about what is this gonna do beyond me? And so one way to, to think about this, has, have people heard about the valley of death when we talk about innovations? Essentially, it's this, this idea where you develop this really cool product, like this awesome microphone. But if you have this awesome microphone, how are you gonna get that to the market? How are people gonna buy this? How are they gonna use it? How are they gonna interact with it? There is essentially this valley that <laughs> comes up where it's really hard to move from cool product to actual use and impact. The same thing exists for research. You can have an excellent publication, but in order to move it to something that's actually going to result in a policy change or a new kind of initiative, there's this valley that you have to kind of overcome in order to get there. And that's a really big nut that we haven't been able to crack, but it's a critical piece to making sure that our work has impact. Um, one example of this. Uh, in Guatemala, uh, chronic malnutrition and stunting is a huge problem. And if you actually go into rural villages and you ask people how many of your children are stunted, many people will say none of them because the entire village's community of children all are stunted, all have chronic malnutrition to the point that you can't even differentiate that there's a problem there. There's this really cool uh, innovation called quality protein maize. It's a type of corn that has 90% of the protein of milk. And corn is a staple of the Guatemalan diet. So if you can get people to consume this new type of corn with a more complete protein source, you presumably can have a big impact on chronic malnutrition and stunting. The problem is the, the Guatemalan villages don't recognize that malnutrition is a problem. So you can't go into the village and say, hey, we have this more nutritious corn. If you grow this and eat this, your family will be more healthy because they don't see that there's a problem. What they did is they worked with social marketing to try to understand why do communities not care or not really uptake this corn because of malnutrition. And they found that if they just kind of tweaked the way that they marketed this type of corn in the communities, people were really excited about it and wanted to eat it. So they have this type of corn called Fortaleza. And basically it means that if you eat this corn, you'll be more resilient, it'll be healthier, it tastes really good. Um, and they kind of tapped into the areas about this corn that would make it more appealing to people to buy. And so by marketing this corn in this way, people are starting to use it. There's essentially that uptake, we've crossed the valley of death. People are excited to purchase this corn, to grow it, and to consume it for their families. And then finally, partnerships. So we have to develop true partnerships, which is a really difficult thing to do. It's very easy to collaborate with people, to find a 
kind of mutual interest or mutual benefit that exists um, in doing a joint research project or kind of combining efforts to get something done. But in order to get a true partnership, it has to be sustainable. It has to be a genuine partnership. There has to be balance. There has to be mutual interest. And this is a really difficult thing to actually achieve, but it's really critical. One of our programs that we support at USAID is called the PEER program. And essentially what we do is USAID funds an in-country researcher and we pair them with a, a researcher in the US who is funded by NIH, NSF, and they work together on a collaborative research project for about two to three years. Um, we've seen that once that two to three year grant period ends, very often it continues beyond our funding, which is phenomenal. Um, one example of where we really saw the impact of this was in Sierra Leone. So in the 2014 uh, Ebola outbreak, there was a peer research team, so a US and uh, Sierra Leone uh, researchers were working together on Lassa fever, which is a similar virus to Ebola. And what happened was they were able to pivot very quickly when the Ebola outbreak uh, kind of became uh, known to direct their efforts to studying Ebola, to monitoring the epidemic. Uh, the, the partner in the US, which was based at Tulane University, was able to do some genomic sequencing, um, and they were able to kind of very quickly start responding to the Ebola outbreak. This is a much more effective model than if we had just said to Tulane, hey, can you go to Sierra Leone and start studying Ebola? Um, there was, they didn't have that infrastructure without that local partner. So we really saw the benefit of having this um, established, sustained engagement in country that could actually have an impact on solving a much larger problem. Oh, and they also developed, um, as part of that collaboration, the first of its kind rapid diagnostic test for Ebola. Uh-oh. Well, anyway, uh, the last thing I wanted to just do was a shameless plug for something that my office is currently working on. So we have out on the street right now a request for information to help us to better uh, define our next wave of programming in science, technology, and research. And so it actually closes today at 5 p.m., so you'd have to move quick, <laughs> maybe on your lunch break or something. But if you have an interest, we're accepting um, some suggestions and information about how you think we can better attack these problems. So we would welcome anyone or any of your colleagues to submit information to our RFI. And that's it. Thank you so much. And we'll be happy to answer questions um, as part of our Q&A. So we're going to go ahead and any clarifying questions quickly for Michelle. If not, we'll jump into to Karthi K. Because we're going to have lots of time at the end to ask questions. That's the whole point is to ask questions. So if not, I'll just jump to Karthi K. And he can uh, give us a few minutes for about, of his time. Thank you. That was an <clears throat> excellent presentation and a really good segue, I think. Um, because what I'm going to present, <clears throat> if I don't lose my voice, is um, an interesting case of the challenge of energy access. So one of those goals that Michelle was talking about, the sustainable development goals, is sustainable energy. Um, and I'm going to borrow from not only my um, PhD work, which I concluded not too long ago, uh, but also uh, my work at the US Department of Energy uh, to try to you know, um, get you to converse about science and technology and its role in introducing poverty. Um, I'll start first with this right here. Um, this is my own ancestral home. Uh, in the western, northwestern state of Rajasthan in India. Um, my grandfather and his brothers built, um, built this house, and it's a, it's a desert environment. This is what the desert looks like in the Thar Desert. Um, when it rains, it blooms, and they are able to do some subsistence level farming. Uh, approximately 300 million people in India don't have energy access currently, and that's out of 1.2 billion people. Um, and so that approximate 300 million is pretty much the size of the US population, if you can think about it in those terms. So in the 1970s, uh, my grandfather filed the application to have the grid extended to his house so that he could have centralized grid electricity. Uh, he passed away in the early 80s, uh, and we received electricity access a few years ago. Um, this is the story of energy access um, in India, in many other parts of the world, where approximately, I think the figures a couple years ago was 1.6 billion people don't have access to electricity around the world, but I'm sure it's come down um, to something like 1.2 or 4 through the efforts of the UN Energy Access for All initiative. 
Um, but so if we think about um, science and technology uh, addressing uh, inclusive innovation, and you think about what kinds of ecosystems or scenarios generate uh, the need for that inclusive innovation, I think it's really that scarcity um, and the aspiration of people to fill that void. Um, and so through my research, in which I traveled uh, extensively across the country to find out what kinds of innovations uh, were at play to help address the issue of energy access, I found some really interesting things. Um, and to start with, uh, it's not just the technology, but it's also the methods of deployment of that technology. Um, and so I'll speak a little bit about the business innovations um, as well. So to start with, um, there's a company called Greenlight Planet and it, it provides a really interesting case. So it sold the most number of these sort of Pico solar products. And it, let, me, let me add that I'm not an advocate for um, uh, sort of off-grid solar technologies, the sort of unit uh, that I was analyzing. Um, but it is a method to provide some level of services. And there are increasing amounts of um, innovation in that sphere that are providing more than just basic level of access. Because when we talk about energy access, um, it's been so divorced from the climate change sphere. Uh, where we talk about you can only emit this much globally in order to not go off the rails. We're okay with estimating um, some sort of basic level of energy access for people in the global south and in developing countries uh, that sort of traps them into a new kind of energy poverty. So lanterns are not uh, you know, the answer for everybody's energy needs, but they're an interesting innovation to study. Um, and so Greenlight Planet um, developed a really interesting um, business model called direct marketing, um, which really helped accelerate the diffusion of off-grid, quality off-grid solar technologies. Because when we talk about uh, inclusive innovation, it's not about uh, providing less for less, low, low cost technologies um, and low quality service. It's about pro providing quality goods and services. So this is actually a company that provides quality uh, goods. Uh, and they developed this model where everybody could be a sales agent. Um, so we're talking, if you heard about the L'Oreal model or Amway, where you can sort of be selling, uh, you can become a sales agent and get some concessions. Imagine employing that particular model to selling solar. That is something that's sort of come about more recently as an innovation. Um, and so in the state of eastern state of Bihar, uh, which is uh, the e most economically and, and energy impoverished state, um, they developed a model uh, uh, of dire direct marketing. Um, and so I have two figures here, 2012 uh, and then 2014. This is before and after um, the deployment of the model. So imagine sort of a zonal business manager uh, who's overseeing about approximately six regional sales managers, uh, each of whom is overseeing three to four district level sales managers, each of whom is managing up to eight or more team leaders who are then in charge of up to 16 locally embedded sales agents who you might know, it might be the local nurse, it might be the local teacher, somebody who's working part time and constantly communicating up this chain to help diffuse these technologies. And of course, they're getting a cut of the profits, but in this way, they're also addressing one of the fundamental barriers to the diffusion of these kinds of innovations in markets where um, they might be hard to manage, where they're introduced, where people may not have familiarity with these kinds of technologies, which is uh, servicing, after sales servicing and maintenance. So if you have somebody that's locally uh, embedded, the innovations that come out can actually be serviced, they can actually um, be better managed and, and increase consumer confidence in actually wanting to accept not only these innovations, but other innovations that may come, come on down the road um, that uh, Michelle was talking about. Um, and so what do these, some of these people look like and what are some of the other models? If I can, here we go. So this is, um, this is a guy that I met in the Sundarbans, uh, which is the largest mangrove uh, in the world. It straddles India and Bangladesh. Um, and that area is um, just sort of a hotbed of activity uh, for uh, the, the need for energy, first of all, because they're islands, they're forest areas, often laws uh, prohibit the access of central grids going into such areas. So it creates this vacuum, this sort of scarcity and necessity to drive the innovation. Um, and what ends up happening is that people like this are able to take advantage of the rapidly declining costs of solar photovoltaics, which have come about thanks to a lot of uh, large-scale manufacturing in places like China, um, and then create their own models to distribute these technologies, actually at full cost, um, which throws up some really interesting questions about um, willingness to pay or how much, how do people save? We often thought about uh, solar in the last few decades as something that was very expensive, and it's true it was, and it was out of reach uh, of people. Uh, and so end-user financing became sort of the government 
policy to try to get people access to these technologies. But what we're finding now is not only has the cost of the technology declined, but also the business innovations have allowed people like this, who may not, who may be semi-literate, who may have gotten six weeks of training in nearby Calcutta, um, and can do bulk procurement and bring down the costs dramatically. Um, and if you go to this ecosystem, it's just fantastic. Um, I mean, I was as I was going through these neighborhoods and these villages, I guess I should say, um, I started counting the solar panels on these roofs. And after a while, I just gave up because I realized that I'd arrived in a place where these these technologies are proliferating uh, in a way that you would not expect. And it's, it's even more dramatic on the other side of the border in Bangladesh, um, where the government policies have really helped deploy these technologies through end user financing, um, but not so much in this case. Um, so there are individuals like this who get a little bit of technical training and are able to be part of that innovation chain um, and really create that ecosystem. Here's another gentleman who essentially had, uh, he's an, a local electrician. He went and got, again, six weeks of training in Calcutta or some other city not far from there. Um, and, you know, his other business is just selling light bulbs and fans, but now he's able to be part of that chain um, to help deploy and manage uh, the technologies. Um, here's a gentleman who, along with his wife, if we can get this going, sorry. Yes, um, have set up a, a unique model to, to, not on, not, to not give ownership for certain technologies, but to create this model uh, where you're renting technologies. Um, so you don't have to have full-on asset ownership, and it's really getting to the extreme base of the pyramid. Um, because let me just say that the, the solutions provided by solar um, uh, can be expensive and can certainly go to the higher end of the market, um, but they can. They also need to be used uh, to those who are absolutely destitute, um, you know, who are at the bottom of the bottom of the pyramid. And how can you get them access to s clean energy services um, in in the ecosystem where government policies aren't delivering at the rate that they should? So this is a rental charging uh, model for uh, solar lanterns, where you know somebody comes by and gives something like the equivalent of five cents a day, or maybe even less, actually, um, to rent these lanterns on a daily basis. Uh, and they're all charged through this um, solar photo photovoltaic uh, system on the rooftop. Um, and she has very limited training and has been training herself uh, in how to do a little bit of maintenance of these lanterns. And I'll get to sort of what science and technology policy needs to do to further uh, enrich this ecosystem in just a bit here. Um, here's an example of a, of a gentleman in a village, again in West Bengal, um, who was a little bit wealthier than his neighbors in a village. And this is, again, the place that does not have access to the grid and most likely will not. Um, he took on a loan, a fairly large loan, to set up a 30 kilowatt microgrid system uh, to be able to then essentially be the local utility for his neighbors. Um, and he could set the rates, uh, provide services like lighting, mobile charging, phones, televisions, refrigeration. When you get to the microgrid level, that's where you can really provide beyond lighting services that are really genuine energy access. Um, but the problem with this model can be um, he could be a local power monopoly. Um, and in a country where you can have all kinds of discrimination based on caste and religion, uh, where you're already out in far-flung areas without the ability to police um, such systems, who's to say what he's going to charge, uh, you know, wildly different rates to different customers of different backgrounds. So that was an interesting thing. He didn't actually want me to interview his customers, um, but I had, um, I had to wait for a ferry and I had a couple hours. So when he wasn't looking, I did ask a few customers and it was, it was different rates. And I didn't, I mean, it was, you know, this is anecdotal. I didn't do a full on everybody that he was providing services to, but I got some complaints. And, um, and that does throw up some questions of how do we manage these innovations once they're deployed in the field and what kinds of policies can help do that. Nope. Um, here's a gentleman who um, has had enough familiarity with these technologies um, to then not go towards any one company uh, to purchase. Um, uh, you know, purchase from only just one company to put together the entire system. Because the thing with these systems is it's not just about the panel. Um, there's a charge controller, there's batteries, there's lighting, there's the wires. Um, so what he did is um, he bought the panel from one company. He bought the wiring from another. He bought the battery from another. Uh, the lighting fixtures from another. And the television, the flat screen television, which you can now power with this, uh, thanks to innovations in super efficient appliances, funded in part by USAID. Um, 
so he was able, we reached a point where people at the bottom of the pyramid can sort of make these de decisions about how best uh, to get access to the services they need in the most cost-effective manner. So all these companies are then forced to provide quality, um, uh, quality solutions um, because eventually people will want to make those decisions on their own rather than just have sort of a kit that comes together um, that may have its own challenges. Um, Here is a company in the state of southern state of Karnataka, which is selling to a much higher um, uh, income bracket clientele. Uh, this is sort of a glass panel you can't see in the in the room here, but there's a glass panel boutique. I almost felt like I was going to a fancy solar shop, and this is also in a small peri-urban area. But he's providing all kinds of solar AC and DC solutions: hot water heaters, street lights, um, things that can power an entire modern Indian home in solar. And the idea is that you know he was a graphic designer, um, and he decided to become a franchisee of this solar company. Uh, and he works under a tight system of um, sales uh, targets um, in order to meet, um, to continue to be able to sell this company's brand of products. And he's getting the kinds of training he needs to manage supply chains, to do inventory, um, and to train other staff in maintenance and servicing. And it's, create, again, enriching this ecosystem, which is, in a way, going to continue to rub up against the centralized grid electricity system. So this is not quite a battle between technologies. I know it's often thought of as, you know, will these technologies become obsolete when the grid does arrive? But you have to understand that the grid exists in places like this, but it's often extremely highly unreliable uh, and erratic. So people still need some of these solutions. Uh, and even like in the United States, where and tariffs and certain policies are getting people to buy solar. My parents live in South Carolina, and um, they just bought solar for their rooftop thanks to a variety of subsidies, both from the power companies and, and the federal and state level. Um, that is going to start happening in India. So we will need people to be able to be part of that, um, you know, uh, that solution. And then finally, I think I just have two more slides to give you examples from. Finally, there's a component of training the people in, in managing, um, again, another example of training people in the management of uh, inclusive technologies and in the, in the deployment of them and in the making of them. Uh, there's a place in the western state of Rajasthan, again, where I come from, called Barefoot College. And the idea there is that semi-literate grandmothers are trained in the making of um, solar systems of all kinds. And not just, you know, this is a solar parabolic cooker uh, they also do solar home lighting systems and, and lanterns, and, uh, but they also make the tools with which to make these. And I'm talking about down to the circuit boards. Um, I, was, I spent a good afternoon next to all these ladies uh, essentially assembling you know, circuit boards with jumper wires and capacitors and all of those things, things that I didn't even know. I mean, I'm studying this technology, but had, had I thought about building the technology? No. Um, and here are these women who can't, they're from different states in India, and they actually have a program through, um, other, with, through ministries of foreign affairs of other countries to bring people from the Congo, from Haiti, to train them from around the world. And they can't really communicate with each other, uh, but they can communicate on the technology. They'll be able to say, all of them will be able to say capacitator, jumper wire, all of that, and assemble these technologies, but they won't be able to actually communicate. Um, and so here's a program to actually make people a part of the entire value chain. Um, and I think that's something that needs to be supported further. So some of the findings of my research were that in people in this sort of informal um, sector that's trying to deal with a pretty high-end uh, technology need to have the right level of, of skills and training um, to be able to provide quality um, services and technology, not just something that's less for less, but what, something that's more um, for less. And, um, and so there are a variety of policies that hopefully we can discuss that um, can be used to support that. And, and some of that during my time at yeah, during my time at the Department of Energy was to support the launch of something called Mission Innovation, uh, which was launched at the UN climate negotiations in Paris two years ago now. Um, and the idea was to double uh, the clean energy R&D um, of 22 countries plus the EU, uh, which make up 80% of the global clean energy R&D already. So if we can, if as Michelle said, we can show the impact of R&D um, on the improvement of the GDP, um, getting countries to be a part of this pact uh, including India, was quite a feat, um, and they've agreed to double that R&D in the next five years. So India spent something like 70 million um, on clean energy R&D. That's their baseline. It was quite a, quite a process to figure out what the baseline is, because there's so many institutions involved at the sub-national level that may, may be a part of that. Um, and then they're going to increase it to approximately 142, or even more. In some cases, countries are tripling it or quadrupling it, because they recognize the importance of deploying these technologies to address the bigger issue of climate. Um, I think I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. 
And finally, I'd like to back to Bob Donaraj for um, his brief talk, and then we'll open up to questions. Thanks. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dana Raj Thakur. I'm with the Alliance for Affordable Internet, which is a program of the Web Foundation. Um, I should start off with a few points that um, I'm going to talk about our work as it relates to in in income inequality generally and access, access around internet this time, broadband access as opposed to energy access that Kartikeya was talking about. Um, and also to clarify that our work is really focused internationally. So where we are, as we are concerned with issues around inequality and poverty, it is primarily uh, internationally in low and middle income countries and not in the US where, of course, those are issues of concern as well. So the A4AI, the Alliance for Affordable Internet, is one of the biggest uh, technology sector alliances uh, in the world. And we focus on primarily one thing, on the cost of broadband access. Um, and to do this, we focus primarily at the policy and regulatory level. So you've, in the, with the previous speakers, you've heard about different kind of initiatives, especially at the human level, the, the local level, and, and, and the project level. But our work is primarily at the policy level and policy reform. We have a variety of diverse uh, members that make up their lands with many different uh, ideas about how to deal with ICT access and very different ideologies, uh, so to speak. Um, some of these are big technology companies. It includes government agencies like USAID and many other international agencies. But we're, they're all focused on one, on one specific problem, which is the, the affordability aspect of, uh, uh, of, of the internet access problem. So when I say um, the internet access problem, globally, um, Roughly today, according to the International Telecoms Union, about half the world is not online. Now, there are a variety of reasons for this, but one of the main ones is the affordability problem. In other words, access is too expensive. So the Alliance and its members have endorsed a set of policy best practices in order to address this um, affordability problem. And uh, we can get into more details later on. I'll bring up those, a few of them as we, as we go through the presentation. Um, the main ones focus around having competitive markets and ensuring that policies are in place to lower industry costs, which in a competitive environment, the assumption is that can lead to lower prices for the, for the consumer. The main principles that guide our work include uh, internet freedom um, and, and certain assumptions, namely that um, internet access can lead to economic uh, development and that open and, 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 and competitive markets are the most effective way to uh, uh, promote that kind of uh, policy environment for affordable access. Okay, so the lands works at, at, at a local level and also at the international level. And at a local level, we currently work in uh, five countries, which you can see on this map, spread across uh, different regions of the world. We also recently started working in, in Liberia. And at an international level, we also work with many different uh, in, uh, UN agencies and other intergovernmental bodies. Sorry, as quick as not working so well. Okay. At the local level, what we do is the the, the, the model that we use is what we was a, is essentially a multi-stakeholder approach, which which Michelle alluded to early on, which involves getting a diverse set of local actors, so society groups, government agencies, regulators, uh, ministries of ICTs, the mobile phone operators, ISPs, and so on, all in one room and one space to, to identify what are the main policy priorities in that country, which can eventually, through reform, lead to, to lower industry costs. The kinds of policy reforms we talk about um, are mentioned here in the slide, and they include the competitive issue that I, t I mentioned. There are specific uh, strategies such as infrastructure sharing that can be uh, that can promote lower industry costs, uh, access uh, efficient and timely access to spectrum, which is very important for mobile phone operators. And I should I should point out that in the countries that I'm talking about, low and middle income countries, access to the internet is primarily through mobile phones, 
That's why there's an emphasis on uh, the mobile phone sector in our work. Uh, universal access and universal access funds and how they're managed and also efficient broad and effective broadband policies. So there are a variety of areas that we could uh, uh, support these local multi-stakeholder coalitions in, in their policy reforms. The specific area is really up to them and what they prioritize. Hmm. Uh, my clicker is not working so well now. Maybe the battery died <laughs> after all the use. Azran, maybe could you help me just go through the slides then, please? Thanks. Okay, thank you. So, where are we now then with regard to affordability? So, um, you heard about SDGs. There is a specific SDG that deals with internet access, 9C. Um, the target there in that, in that particular system development goal is to have, uh, or the, the word is to strive for universal access in LDCs by 2020. And given the, the current trends, this is gonna, we're gonna achieve that uh, much later than 2020, unfortunately. So the, 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 the importance of um, affordability is very, very uh, significant here when we talk about universal access. Um, next slide, please, thanks. Um, yeah, you can skip that next one. What I wanted to, what I wanted to show here, next slide, please. Oh, yeah, thanks. What I, the other way, yeah, that's it. So what I wanted to show here is what I mean by affordability and to point out uh, some of the issues that arise, particularly with regard to income inequality. So here in this chart, you can see the trends in, uh, in the way affordability is currently defined, which is essentially price, the price of our one gig mobile data plan as a proportion of average monthly income in different regions across the world. The, the bars on the left are from 2013 and it progresses to 2015. So you're looking at three years of, of trends. And you can see uh, in most regions, for example, in Africa, there's been a dramatic reduction in affordability. In other words, the, the proportion of price relative to income has decreased, which means that it's more and more affordable. Here, however, you see what we call uh, our affordability target. This is our 2% target. This is a target that was that we have, through our research, have proposed should be viewed as a, a more accurate target for affordability. And I'll explain what I mean by that. When we uh, talk about what it means to be affordable, typically the United Nations adopted a target several years ago where they defined affordability as having a broadband, mobile broadband plan that was around 5% or less of average monthly income. The problem is, with that target is that over time, what we've seen in many countries is that income inequality is rising. Now, if you have an average target that's based, on national, uh, based on average national income, and where that, that national income is actually very, uh, is highly unequal, then what happens is that a country, a broadband plan might appear affordable in a country, but that would, what's, in reality what's happening is that many low-income groups, in, uh, people that live in low-income quintiles are left out. And in fact, what you'd see is a huge disparity where, for example, in Nigeria, looking at the 2015 data, it might, broadband plans might seem affordable, it might fall under that 5% um, target line, but for the lower income quintiles, the lower, lowest 20%, and the next low, lowest 20%, the, the affordability, this, the same ratio was above 10%. I mean, it was highly unaffordable for those groups. So in effect, what, we, what we're doing is masking the unaffordability that would happen. And that's a function of the increase in income inequality in many of these countries. Of course, another problem is that we want to hold on to a single income threshold, like whether it's a 5% or a 2%. But the problem there is the reality, the politics of the situation. We need to come up, and this is the, this is the, the challenges of translating uh, you know, meaningful research and understanding the reality and ground into a politically feasible target. So we're stuck with the notion of having a one uh, one line threshold for uh, a national, at a national level, what we propose is something lower than. A 2% threshold does mean that it could uh, become more affordable for uh, other income groups. Next slide, please, thanks. 
I've been talking about mobile broadband, as in access through mobile phones. Fixed broadband is another story. Now, a lot of us, or some of us, might have uh, cable internet at home, uh, which is, in fact, what fixed broadband, broadband is. Throughout most of the world, this, however, is very expensive. And you can see, if we look at the lines here, uh, here's our 2% target, and you can see what the, the, the thresholds are in many countries in the world. Um, and of course, it's not a very accurate graph. The reality is that only in Europe can you see uh, the average is below 2%. Next slide, please. So coming back to the issue of in inequality and, and, and poverty, who are those, the groups of people that are most likely to be left out? Who are finding uh, broadband access most unaffordable? And what we find up for, uh, for obvious reasons will be those living in poverty. And here, here I'm referring to the, a higher threshold of $3.1 three, uh, $3 per day. Women in many countries are also uh, left out and the access gap is growing. And uh, uh, people living in rural areas is also an issue. On the point about access, the gender access gap, this is actually very important. Um, in many countries, uh, men are more likely to be online than women in many low and middle income countries. Um, and whereas uh, this gap has been reducing, for some, been reducing for some time, what the latest numbers uh, from 2015 that ITU, the International Telecoms Union, has released is that the gap is now actually growing, uh, which, is, which again is another kind of wake up call for all policymakers everywhere to address this problem. Remember that, again, going back to the assumption that internet access is a good thing, and having everybody online is a good thing. If half the population, i.e. women, uh, are being left out, then we're not going to achieve any of these goals. Uh, next slide, please. So to, to refer to some other research that we have done uh, through the Web Foundation, uh, this was based on surveys done in 10 uh, low-income countries uh, across the world where they did uh, household surveys looking at, at levels of access. Uh, in urban communities. And what they found, and here's another statistic that is equally as, as worrying as the growing gender gap, is that women are 50% likely than men to be accessing the internet. So coming back to the issue then of what kind of policy recommendations can we make and what do we advocate for? I mentioned the issue of the 2%. So here, here is a, a problem that we came across in terms of our concern is affordability, but how is affordability defined? And it was being previously defined as uh, broadband would be affordable if people uh, could, afford, could purchase a 500 meg uh, plan, a data plan, at 5% or less of their average monthly income. That is how the United Nations has typically defined it. So think about that, it's a 500 meg plan uh, that you would use for a month. 500 megs of data, uh, if, it sounds, if it sounds like a lot, it's really very, very small, right? Uh, that's like maybe less than a few minutes of, of watching a YouTube video in high, really high quality. The other problem was that the income threshold. So what, and which I said was at 5%, which would mask unaffordable, um, the affordability levels in particularly low income quintile groups. So what we propose then is to redefine what affordability is at a higher level, what we call a one for two target, one gig at 2% a, a or less of average monthly income. And this is what we've been advocating for. Uh, the other thing that we want to, that we've been also focusing on recently is around the issue of public access. So a lot of, uh, a lot of public policies in the, in the broadband policies in particular will focus on how to lower in, uh, industry costs and what can be done to increase um, uh, investments by mobile phone operators. But what is clear to us is that there's always gonna be a group that mobile phone operators and private investments will not target uh, for whatever reasons. And in those cases, public access solutions are very important. And this can, there are a range of ways and this can be done through public libraries, through public Wi-Fi, and so on. And then finally, another key point is with regard to the gender gap that I mentioned earlier, which is growing not, uh, internationally and within several, within specific countries, it's actually quite immense. What's required there is that broadband policies need to become more gender responsive. And what we've found is that this is, um, 
it's a very interesting, uh, uh, interesting or, or perhaps worrying in terms of how to bring different sectors together. When you go into a room to talk to ICT policy specialists, they have most, mo usually there's no uh, thinking around gender issues. And when you go into a room to people talking about gender policies, they're usually, again, not always, no thinking around ICT or broadband access issues. And so for us, working at these local levels through these multi stakeholder coalitions, what's important is to bring these different groups together and, and raise the issue around gender access in, in, in broadband policies, something that's new for many places. As it currently is, based on our surveys, there are very few countries in the world that even consider the gender question when we talk about uh, broadband access or broadband policies, or have taken the next step and have tried to address them uh, in, their own, in their own broadband policies, whether through thinking about uh, training and skills for women and girls, or uh, uh, safety around public access issues, or, or whatever, it, whatever might be uh, relevant to their situation. Okay, I think I have one last slide. Yeah, okay, that was it actually. <laughs> uh, so thanks again, and we'll have to take some questions afterwards. So as our panelists come up to, to, the, to those chairs, I realized I didn't introduce myself. It's probably useful, who am I? So I'm a professor at Stony Brook University. My name's Thomas Woodson. I focus a lot on innovation policy in developing countries. And so this is kind of my research area, and this was one reason why I have this panel, I'm, I'm passionate about this topic, but yet often in science technology policy conferences, we don't talk about poverty issues as much. So I really want to kind of highlight this issue. So if the panelists can come on, come on up, and um, I'll pass the microphone to them. So let's see. Um, I guess the, uh, this is on, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I mentioned mission innovation, and one of the challenges of that, even as it was getting launched, was the um, question of what the, the con whether or not Congress would approve it, uh, what would happen to that dedicated increase, incremental increase in, in clean energy R&D over the next five years. Um, so one of my uh, recommendations to the incoming administration would be to um, ensure that we don't stop the incredible amounts of um, money that goes into R&D here in the United States, not just for, uh, it, it goes a lot into defense and a variety of other uh, sectors, but certainly clean energy R&D is something that has had an uptick in the last eight years, and it's something that needs to continue to happen. Um, and it has seen, uh, you know, the impacts have been felt uh, on the sort of, uh, on the solar front, there's been a dramatic decline in the cost of solar as a result of um, uh, investments in R&D. And I think if we're to sort of uphold our international commitment to jointly tackling this issue, one of the ways to do it is to, uh, the issue of climate uh, is to continue to invest in, in clean energy R&D and the spillover um, effects of that, of creating this ecosystem that can help um, reduce poverty, I think is, is critical. So one, that's one of the recommendations that I'd have. So my, my position to comment on this is a little bit tenuous since <laughs> I, of course, serve at the <laughs> for the federal government. Um, but my hope would be that USAID and other development initiatives remain in the forefront of our kind of three-pronged approach that I mentioned before, which is development, diplomacy, and defense. So under the Obama administration, we made considerable progress in kind of recognizing development as being critical to that. Uh, approach. And so I think we need to ensure that development remains part of that. We continue to have support um, and be able to work within that kind of coalition between the State Department and Department of Defense in order to see continued progress on a lot of the objectives we've been able to meet in the last eight years. Um, and so we can kind of keep that momentum going over the next administration. Uh, yeah, so um, just a just two things that come to mind then. So one is that I mentioned earlier our work that focuses internationally, and I would, I would think and I'd hope that the new administration would continue that uh, outlook, that there are many uh, important issues going on elsewhere in the world that need to be addressed and supported, and that those issues are all connected to what's happening here in the US. Uh, the second thing, and more specific to the ICT sector, um, is 
um, issues around how the internet is managed, how it's governed, uh, the, the trends that we have seen uh, recently in, in, uh, in the U.S. stances with, with regard to internet governance is, is, is positive, I think. Uh, and more specifically around uh, issues such as net neutrality uh, have been received well uh, here and elsewhere. Um, it would be uh, important, I think, for the new administration to, to maintain those stances with regard to net neutrality and inter internet governance. Great, so how about from the audience? Any questions you have um, for the panelists? And you can say your name when you, as you, as you say your question as well. Yes, sir? So my, my name is John Happy, uh, sort of generalist interested in all this. Uh, I wonder if you could each comment, or some of you could comment, on how strongly these kinds of initiatives taking root outside the U.S. around the world, because I think it's possible that the U.S. is going to be back in the way from its commitments in these areas. So how will it go if that happens? So I'll repeat, the, before you know, I'll repeat the question. So I think your question was, um, if the USA does back away from its commitments, how will, will it happen? What will be the consequences of that? Is that kind of sure? Okay. And I'll take another question, too, and we'll do some other time. Yeah, my name is Phil Thomas. I'm at George Mason University. I'm the director of the World of Food Security Project here. But I have a, a general question. How much is spent for private R&D in the United States and globally on this type of science and technology? How much is spent governmental? And then how much is spent for defense in the total governmental budget? Can you get that point? To me, I just went to a CSIS conference about three weeks ago, and the R&D budget in science and tech for defense was nearly 80 billion a year out of an 800 billion or 600 billion dollar budget. There seems to be some, you know, this imbalance. Okay. So let's take the, those two questions first, and then we'll jump to the next round. So, um, please, panelists, if you have any thoughts. So I'd focus on the first question. Um, and yes, it would be unfortunate that the government was to step away, the US government was to step away from their investments and initiatives abroad. Um, one of the things that the Alliance has been working on is, is these local multi-stakeholder coalitions that I mentioned. And in most cases, uh, while we're still a young organization, two to three years old, many of them have been able to take on their own, uh, uh, take on work themselves and to advocate for policy reforms in their countries by themselves, which which is good for us because that's the goal for them to eventually um, become more, uh, take more ownership of these reforms. Um, that said, they, they still, there's still going to be a lot of complementary things that are happening elsewhere that, that can support these uh, initiatives. The U.S. State Department has something called Global Connect, which is, which is another major initiative, and it would be good to see, which, which supports uh, internet access globally, right, in many, in, in many areas. So it would be good to see things like that continue. Uh, also to the first question, so USAID works in a very decentralized model, so we have um, overseas missions in over 80 countries where we work, and the, the focus of those missions is really to support local government in advancing the objectives that are needed to meet the objectives of that country. So even if the United States steps away from some of its commitments, we, I think, have very strong partnerships in those countries and can continue to provide kind of some of that support that needs to exist, even if it's not financial. Um, we have seen a lot of real enthusiasm for the types, especially science and technology initiatives in country. And I feel like we've kind of catalyzed enough of that excitement and energy that you know, we, we often talk about working ourselves out of a job. That's really what we're trying to do. <laughs> so the goal is that people are not dependent on USAID, but can kind of get some technical assistance or initial support and then take it and run with it. So that's actually a good thing if we can kind of push countries to move in that direction without our direct um, investment. Um, of course, it's all really unpredictable at this point, but we hope that we'll be able to continue the momentum that we've started. Um, and to your question, sir, I do not have the amounts memorized um, for defense and um, development spending um, in terms of private R&D investments. Um, it's a great question, and I think we could probably look it up offline, <laughs> um, but I don't have that. I'm not sure if my fellow panelists do. Yeah, on that second one, I also don't have that memorized. But um, the the interesting thing, if, if I can keep going back to mission innovation, is that uh, the idea is that it the 
countries invest um, in, in domestic R&D, but it's matched by the Breakthrough Energy Coalition, which is made up of, I think, something like 20 to 40 uh, philanthropists and industrialists from around the world that will also match that funding. Um, so I think there's already sort of this recognition um, that private industry needs to also be a part of that solution. And I think um, increasingly work with governments. Um, and and I unfortunately don't have that figure, but to mirror kind of what happens with the defense um, spending, you know, DARPA um, uh, is is the agent is this is a part of that um, defense budget uh, that supports science and technology innovation that is used for defense. Uh, but that has now been that model has been taken for ARPA um, in in the Department of Energy, which is supposed to funnel massive amounts of funding, and probably not at the scale of eighty billion. Um, but that's you know something that could be beefed up for things like energy technology specifically. Um, and to go back to the first question. Um, <clears throat> I happened to be in Marrakesh in Morocco for the UN climate negotiations when the elections results came out. Um, and certainly uh, the results cast a pretty long shadow um, on the process. Uh, but what we were starting to already see is that countries have stepped forward. And I think even if the United States, for whatever reason, doesn't um, support uh, science and technology and inclusive innovation um, policies that will impact other countries, we're starting to see that countries like China and India um, and, and even uh, African countries coming together are really positioning themselves to be able to not only uh, innovate in this space, but also help to, you know, the policies there, they know that they need to be able to deploy some of these technologies to address um, poverty issues at home. Another question? I think, yes, sir, in the back there. You're... Yes, um, whenever we talk about technology and development, we usually emphasize physical technology. But throughout your presentations, I heard a lot of emphasis on translation and delivery, the sort of the last mile problem. And as a social scientist, that suggests to me that there's also a social science component. Do you all think about social science, or do you focus very heavily on physical science? And is there something we need to rethink about uh, how we go about thinking about social systems and their transformation? Well, answer that question. We're running out of time, so go ahead and answer that question. Um, just briefly, yeah. So um, actually. A good part of my own dissertation work was on, uh, so the diffusion of this is, is not just the technologies, but also the methods, right? Um, and so I think policies that facilitate, um, uh, you know, in the case of in the case of India, setting up incubators and accelerators, industrial training institutes that can really help people think critically about how to use these technologies and deploy them is critical. Um, because like I said, one of the biggest challenges um, is getting it to the last mile. And so there have to be innovations in the business models to getting them out there, uh, early adopters, and things like that are all critical components of getting some of these innovations um, socialized and accepted. Uh, so that's certainly something that I come across very frequently with these technologies. I think your question's a really strong one. Um, the social science is absolutely critical, but it's often overlooked because it's not as exciting per se, as some of the innovations you can stick on the shelf. So it's really easy to point to a cell phone microscope or something you know tangible that people really can relate to. It's much harder to kind of sell the, um, you know, innovative approaches or techniques that can really help us do our work better. Um, so there's a bit of a messaging disconnect. Um, we definitely think it's important and we're trying to support it, um, especially at USAID, but in general, I think there's this kind of gap between, um, you know, people tend to gravitate toward the sexy new innovation and less toward, um, you know, what is the best way to poll a community or to, um, you know, roll out a new uh, technology. So I think there's definitely work to be done in that space. Yeah, that, that is a good question. And um, I think I should have emphasized in my presentation that our work is primarily on policy advocacy and at these, with, through these uh, local uh, multi stakeholder coalitions. So in fact, we are very concerned and very interested in, in policy processes, in, in political processes, in how we can advocate uh, for different uh, uh, policy goals to be achieved in these different areas. And of course, it's our own in the ICT sector but understanding these different policies and uh, the social environment in which they operate is very important. There is um, a lot of uh, a literature in, about policy process in the US, and I'd argue that there's not enough to understand policy process in many of the countries that we operate in. Uh, so if there are people that are interested in understanding this more, I'd be glad to work with you. And then um, you, you talked about 
time to create two more questions. So you can start in the front and think. Um, then you see, so maybe say your questions and then we can, um, we can answer them and then you'll have to close them out. Yes, sir? My name is Robert Blumenthal. With regard to USAID's work, um, is, is any of your efforts related or uh, designed to ameliorate the issues involved with the uh, migration of poor peoples into, into Western Europe today? Okay, yes, sir? Uh, a lot has been said about private public partnerships in Europe, relative areas. Uh, and USA emphasizes that a lot. But historically, you know, there has been this activity between the for profits and government. So my question is, how do you bring about successful private-public partnerships where you take a public interest, for-profit motive, and humanitarian considerations and integrate them into the partnership in some type of a balanced way? Uh, there's a lot of rhetoric internationally about the PPPs, but there's little evidence that they work. And then take one more question in the back there. Thank you. Wenda Bashke, National Science Foundation. I really liked the, um, the comment about quality of the technology, and I think that's it. this is a question for the whole panel and also for us thinking about science, technology, and poverty, is the quality of the technology, whether it's material or knowledge that's being sent, i.e. thinking about cell phone uses. Oftentimes the cell phones that are sold particularly on the African continent don't last very long, and then there's pollution issues, and what happens to that downstream? Just so really thinking about the quality. And if any, but any of you know the story of the African quality um, fuel that is sold in, on the African continent that has so high sulfur content, it would not be sold anywhere else in the world. And it's manufactured particularly for Africa because African countries don't have any policies that prevent that. So really thinking about this issue of quality when we think about science. Right, well, we'll turn over to the panelists um, and answer some of those questions. You choose one of those questions or all of them, but those questions about the immigration. How uh, SNC used for immigration is one question about public private partnerships and how are those being involved? And of course, this quality versus this, um, this quality issue. How do you sell these different products? Uh, so maybe I'll just talk briefly about public private partnerships. Um, one of, so they are, in fact, a very difficult thing to achieve. Um, what, what we've seen is that. Uh, one of the um, you know other problems around these is that they often don't they often come are the investments involve a large amount of money they're often done on a very large scale and they often don't consider uh, the issues around inequality and poverty particularly when we talk about investments in in the telecom sector uh, which is un which is often unfortunate um, how how the pattern which we've seen them evolve particularly in some of the countries where we work is that there's often uh, a lot of intermediaries involved, people that can bring these different partners together. Um, but I would argue that still the process remains, and I agree with that the process still remains imperfect, and especially for addressing the, 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 the trends in inequality, we're still not seeing a solution around there, um, although they still remain very important. Um, I'll take the public private partnership one first, and then I'll do the migration question. So for public-private partnerships, I think the critical piece is finding a, a true common interest that actually gives a value add to each of the organizations that are in the mix. Um, it's not enough to just say, oh, this is part of our CSR policy that you know we're doing some good by helping USAID or helping an NGO advance their working country, but it really has to be tied to some type of benefit for a for-profit organization. So an example would be Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola obviously is a global company. They're looking um, for new markets. They have to find sources of clean water. And so by partnering Coca-Cola with an organization that's working to promote clean water, there's that value add for both organizations that tends to be more successful than just saying, oh, you know, this one organization has some money as part of their corporate social responsibility you know, initiative. Let them put it here and hope it does something. That's not an alignment of incentive. Um, so there really has to be that clear connection between what you know the development practitioners or NGOs want to get done and what the for-profit company wants to get done. Um, the topic of migration is one that's 
USAID is definitely working on. Um, it is an extremely large challenge. We have several bureaus at USAID that are all contributing to that effort, and we have a task force internally that's helping to coordinate the response. Um, largely, we have a humanitarian type response at the moment. Um, in Syria and some other countries in the region, um, we're working closely with DFID and other partners on how to, to effectively ameliorate the issues. Um, it's a really difficult topic, um, and the volume is just extraordinary. Um, our administrator often <laughs> says that, you know, we have this long list of, of areas right now where USAID is responding to crises or disasters, and it seems like we haven't been able to take any of those off the list, so we're still responding to Ebola, and that's now, you know, two years past the, the point of the height of the outbreak. Um, and so it's a very difficult um, thing to tackle when we have these prolonged complex crises to manage. Um, and it's definitely one where we have to really rely on the support of the larger development community to see an impact. Um, because we as USAID cannot do it alone. Um, so it's definitely a challenge that we're grappling with. So I'm going to come back to that quality piece that you mentioned. Uh, you know, I desperately tried to find a graveyard of solar technologies in India um, because some of these things are um, can be so cheap um, and can really proliferate. Um, there are a lot of, quote, fly-by-night operators that sell a variety of products that may not last more than a few days. Um, I could not find that. Um, I could not find a graveyard of solar technologies. And part of that, in India at least, I don't know about in other geographies, um, is that there's a pretty uh, solid... Um, uh, recycling, informal recycling industry. So I think somehow these technologies find a way into scrap metal and other collectors and somehow get taken out of the ecosystem. Um, but there is a really genuine concern of, uh, you know, they do sit on the shelf for a while. You don't know when this person's going to come around and collect and how much of what heavy metal might leach out of these products. Um, you know, the uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance just re released a report in which they said there might be something like 44 million unbranded um, solar products that are out in the market. And these are the technologies that don't have the right standards or uh, maintenance networks that really need to be watched out for that can ruin the consumer confidence um, in some of these innovations. Um, and so, you know, policies that create um, standards for these technologies, that uh, create uh, facilities that you can actually test for these technologies, as does a person uh, from a poor, poor rural area actually know that they're getting a 100-watt panel when they're paying for it? Because um, in some cases, it might be a 50-watt panel. And what are the ways that the, both the entrepreneurs that are selling these technologies as well as um, the people that are purchasing them can know that they're getting quality assurance. I think that's critical. And so there need to be policies in place um, that, that can sort of set these standards and regulate them. Well, we are out of time, unfortunately. It's a great talk. Um, panelists are, will be kind of in and out. So if you have a chance, get their card, your email addresses, so you can email them. Um, and of course, I'll be here all day. So if you have more questions, I'd love to talk to you. But thank you so much for coming.